Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Um, in this video today we're going to go through the concept of titration by pH monitoring. So, so far we've been looking at the concept of titration um, using an indicator. Okay, so we're reacting uh, typically an acid and a base, uh, reacting together one in the burette, um, so we've got one in the burette, another substance in a conical flask, and we add in a certain amount of each reactant, and then inside our mixture we have an indicator. Okay, and so remember that the purpose of an indicator is colour change. Okay, and so what we're, we want that um, to be able to do is to identify, um, we use it to identify the endpoint, which we want to be as close to the equivalence point of the titration as possible, that we the equivalence point being when the moles of each, the reactants have exactly cancelled one another out. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, um, we the colour change in the indicator, we want to occur as close to this point as possible, because that tells us when we've reached it, we look for the colour change in that one drop, and then we switch off the burette, and that tells us when we're in the right spot. Okay? Um, but the reality is that um, the colour change um, is not always the most reliable way for us to conduct a titration. It can, you know, with practice, um, you've already developed some practice so far, that, that you can get much better at being able to identify the when the colour has changed, but some indicators are easier than others to be able to tell. Um, you know, especially like something like phenolphthalein is, is one of the better ones to be able to distinguish because you're going from colourless to pink. Whereas when you get versions like bromothymol blue, when we go from yellow to blue with a green um, colour change point, um, depending on what you're reacting, that can be hard to judge. And so we're looking at this, the concept of what if there was a better way? What if there were a more accurate, um, more straightforward way to be able to, de to work out when the equivalence point has been reached? And so that's where we come up with the concept of pH monitoring instead. Okay, so now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking you through what that means. Okay, so when we're thinking about titration by pH monitoring, we are thinking about using a pH electrode. Um, often, but not, it doesn't have to be, uh, coupled with a data logger as a way for us to monitor the pH of the reaction mixture during uh, the titration. So we would have our conical flask with our solution. Uh, this is our, you know, our reaction mixture. So it starts off as being 100% one reactant. As we add in the other from the burette, then we're getting a combination of different things. When we get to the equivalence point, it's all the, the ions, the product, and then as we add more, then we've, we've reached an excess. So what we have, we have a pH electrode. Now, so we've used um, bulkier versions of these before, but so we would tend to use a finer one this is not the best representation, but it'll do. Okay, that um, what it does is that it, it gives us a real-time pH reading. Okay, and so what we can do is by monitoring the pH as we've added particular amounts of reactant, we can identify um, where the equivalence point has been reached. Okay, now I'm going to show you how that works now. So this is the mechanics of right. Well, how would you do it? So it could be just giving you a readout that you record down manually, or it could be connected up to a computer and it's plotting the pH against volume added in real time. Okay, so I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to start by talking about a combination of strong acid titrated with strong base. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up um, axes over here that I'm going to work with. Okay, so let's look at the example of HCl being reacted with NaOH to form NaCl and water. Okay, so when, we cons when we're looking at this, so we're going to be um, we're going to be talking about um, the volume of the reactant added. <clears throat> uh, so let's think about this as um, hydrochloric acid in the flask, sodium hydroxide added from the burette, okay, and then on this axis that we've got pH. Okay, and so let's say, so we're starting with, and initially we have 100% HCl. Okay, so if we were to measure the pH, so let's say we've got 7, 14, one. Okay, so let's say we were to monitor the pH, and then we would see that it would start off somewhere around about 
you know, a very acidic pH, like around about pH 1. Okay, and then as we add sodium hydroxide into the mixture, what happens is that some of that hydroxide will react with the acid, and meaning that that, that acidic proton, that H, that hydronium or that H plus is no longer there anymore. So the solution is slightly less acidic than it was as we add more and more base. Now, it hasn't deviated a lot, but it has started to move its way up as the solution is becoming less and less acidic. Now, what happens is that that depletes our supply of HCl. We get less and less of that as time goes on. So what happens is that the solution starts to become drastically, at, we, get, we start to get some more dra dramatic changes in pH. It starts to increase much more steeply once we've reached a certain point. Okay, and then as we're, this is as we're approaching the equivalence point. Now what happens is that around about the equivalence point, the moles of our, um, our acid that's still in the flask is very, very small. And very quickly, what we're going to see is that with that little bit of hydroxide that we add, that we're going to very quickly tip the balance from being an acid solution to being, we're going to react it so it'll cancel out together and then we're going to have a slightly basic solution. So what we see is that within a very tiny bit of volume added, our pH shoots right up. And then it starts to become, it becomes more and more basic, but it tapers off once we've added more and more. So what happens is that then um, we have this really, so we have this kind of almost this S shape, that we've got this really kind of flat section here, and then get to a point at which it curves up very, very sharply. Oh, that was terrible. Curves up very, very sharply, and then plateaus again. Because at this point, we now have a basic solution, and the more base that we add, it does make it more basic, but it also only makes a, a relatively small change in the pH by that point. What we're particularly interested in um, is this section here, okay? The, this really steep section of the curve. And so what we say is that this is where our, our around about where our equivalence point will be, and it will also be where, if we were to use an indicator, where our colour change will occur and should occur, okay? If it doesn't occur in this point, then we've, we've chosen made a poor choice. But the idea being that this is where the balance, the, the, the tipping point of the balance between acid and acidic solution and a basic solution, as we just pass that equivalence point. And so what we're going to, what we say is that when we look at this steep portion of the curve, we look at the point halfway along. Okay, so halfway. So what we say is that halfway up that steepest part of the curve is the equivalence point. And so we we identify that you know the volume that we added, we we trace it down to the x-axis and we read it from there. The more accurately we collect our data, the more accurately we can determine this volume that was added to get to be at that equivalent, or the volume present at the equivalence point, and then we can continue our calculation from there. Okay, now what we see is that for any acid-based titration, we see a curve that's similar to this. However, exactly where this equivalence point will be, and particularly where the pH is going to be, will vary depending on the strength of the acid and base. Okay, and so, um, I'm going to show you what those are going to look like. Okay, but so I want you to think about, we're going to use the analogy of tug of war to help thinking about this, okay? So when we're thinking about tug of war, the person or the side that wins is the side that is stronger, okay? In general, in general terms, there's a little bit more physics involved in it, but um, that is, the, if we have one side which is stronger, it will dominate or pull towards its side better than the weak side would be, will, okay? And so, what I want you to think about in this graph, this curve that we've developed over here, okay, that we see that the pH around about this equivalence point is very close to 7. So strong acid with strong base um, equals pH 7. Okay? So the pH of the, around the equivalence point will be around pH 7. Okay, so we can monitor the pH and identify that the point at which we reach the equivalence point is going to be very close to 7. Okay, because we think about strong versus strong, we're going to end up pretty much in the middle. If both sides are of equal strength in a tug of war, that it stays pretty much in the middle. Okay, now let's look at the next example. We're going to look at strong acid weak base. 
So we'll go for a different example. Okay, so we're going to look at the example of say HCl plus NH3, which is a weak base. We're going to get ammonium chloride plus water. Okay, and so what we're going to see is that we're going to see the curve is going to look more like this. Okay, so we get a curve here that halfway through the equivalence point is going to be pH less than 7. So strong acid with a weak base is going to be a pH less than 7, that is acidic. Okay, think about it like a the tug of war again. Strong, the strong acid is going to pull more towards its side than the weak base is. So the pH pulls towards the acid side. So it pulls to the acid side. Okay, so strong acid, weak base gives you a pH that is acidic. Okay, now we're going to think about um, weak acid, strong base. Okay, so looking at a scenario of a weak acid, strong base, uh, say acetic acid plus sodium hydroxide, forming sodium acetate plus water. Okay, so we've got weak acid and strong base in our tug of war analogy. Okay, so what we're going to see um, when we do our curve, it's going to start off up here. Okay, so we, what we see here is that it starts off at a higher pH, because remember that um, our acetic acid will have a higher, uh, uh, which is a weak acid, will have a higher pH than HCl at the same concentration, okay, because we're not producing as many hydronium ions. Okay, and then what we see is we end up with a very strongly basic pH, okay, because we're forming a sodium hydroxide solution, and then our equivalence point is going to be pH greater than 7. Okay, same sort of idea. The strong base is more able to pull its the pH the pull the pH towards its side, so the equivalence point at the pH at um, the pH at the equivalence point is going to be greater than seven. Okay, so what we can identify is based on whether we are reacting weak or strong acids and bases, we can predict where the pH of our equivalence point is likely to lie, um, and we can use our understanding of chemistry, weak acids and bases, to be able to articulate why. Now. I, I realise the tug of war analogy is, is a one helpful way to, to, to look at it. The whole reason that it actually works is based on thinking back to our pH of salt solutions. Because when you've got the equivalent, um, when we're at the equivalence point before um, we have actually um, added any excess reactant, what we have is a solution of the salt. And so in this situation, sodium acetate we recognise as a basic salt, and so we have a basic pH. In the previous example, ammonium chloride is an acidic salt, so when we have that solution, it's a, an acidic pH. However, sodium chloride is neutral, so we have um, a neutral pH. Okay, so that's the actual chemistry reason of, of why we observe those pHs. Okay, but so this is just kind of showing you that we can use the monitoring, real-time monitoring of pH of the reaction mixture um, as an alternative way to the use of an indicator to tell us when we've reached the equivalence point of a titration. Um, by monitoring it in real time, either graphing it by hand or using a data logger or graphing in Excel as we go, that we can make accurate determinations of the volume at the equivalence point and then do our, our calculations from there. Okay, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.